Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here in the Pacific Pavilion or the uh, OG Ocean Pavilion, I think, here at COP28. We are really grateful to have you here with us today talking about ocean acidification, monitoring, policy mainstreaming, and financing in the Pacific. Um, and of course, all of this work is really in service of implementing Sustainable Development Goal 14.3, which is to minimize and address ocean acidification. So my name is Jesse Turner, and I'm the director of something called the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. And we are here co-hosting this event today very proudly with the, uh, the United States NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, the US State Department, the OA Alliance, the Ocean Foundation, and uh, of course, our partners at uh, Pacific Community, as well as University of South Pacific that are hosting the uh, Pacific Island OA Center, which you'll hear more about. So I will just quickly preface by saying uh, the Pacific Islands are absolutely, completely, and unequivocally leading on ocean acidification, knowledge generation, by developing regional monitoring and research programs that in time can be leveraged to inform uh, climate, ocean mitigation, adaptation, and resilience building priorities. And that's what we really want to set this work in context today, that it's not just monitoring, it's not just observing for the sake of it. It is information that we need to bring to a coastal zone margin that we can really make real climate adaptation and resilience choices around. And so that's what we really wanna put uh, the work in context for that today. So the side event, we have five speakers, uh, we have 50 minutes. So we'll have some uh, high level remarks and then two different presentations to get a little bit more into the details of the center, what's going on, sharing out goals, partners, successes, and again, highlighting the policy needs and the financing needs around this work. Uh, so just to put us in a little bit more context, does this work? I point here. Great. So the OA Alliance uh, was created in 2016. Our goal is to bring governments, predominantly national governments, as well as subnational governments together to increase ambition for climate action, but also to really transform thinking around planning and response to climate ocean change. And we have a diverse membership. No. No. OK. We have a diverse membership, as you will see. Um, representing national governments as well as many subnational governments. I want to point out several tribes and First Nation indigenous communities as well as cities and ports. And that it's really important that we are thinking about national government leadership, but we're also thinking about that local government leadership because all of them have responsibilities um, and roles to play in this type of work. So through the Alliance, we are working to elevate ocean acidification science and action uh, across these different frameworks here at the UNFCCC, the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, as I mentioned, we have a UN Decade of Ocean Science OA program that is really working to define information needs for purpose. And then of course, showing up to the Our Ocean Conferences and using that as a way to make and drive commitments to OA action by governments and other non-government partners. So just a moment about OA action plans. The Alliance is calling on governments to create what we call these OA action plans. And that's really a strategy for thinking about what they can be doing locally to address acidification. This is just a slide from an event that we hosted uh, maybe two weeks ago in partnership with the Back to Blue initiative that is run by the Economist Impact Group. And they released a policy brief basically calling on more national governments to move into this work and thinking about their roles and responsibilities in OA policy. And an action plan, as I mentioned, is just a way for governments to take an inventory of things they are doing or would like to be doing to better understand and respond to OA in their waters near shore. And the, the biggest question we get, right, is what can you do to address ocean acidification? Yes, we need to reduce emissions, the number one cause of ocean acidification, but there's other things that we can be doing now. And what that looks like is, again, advancing the local science that's gonna be needed to better understand what's going on and which species are most vulnerable, as well as which intervention strategies are gonna be most successful. We need to be reducing land-based pollutions. So these are things like wastewater, 
agriculture runoff, nutrients, nitrates that at a coastal zone level actually ex um, amplify ocean acidification, coastal acidification, and oxygen loss. And the more we can do to reduce those pressures, it'll have a, a sizable impact on what we're seeing signatures of coastal acidification. Advancing adaptation and resilience strategies, we'll talk more a little bit about what those look like, as well as thinking about public awareness. That doesn't mean just to policymakers, but inclusive of policymakers, community members, seafood industry, local, uh, local artisan uh, fisheries, as well as thinking about building international support and what are the responsibilities from international um, mechanisms, international con uh, conventions to support some of this work a little bit more concretely. Uh, and one thing that I just want to bring out today, because you're going to hear a little bit more about this in opening remarks, is the need for financing this work, right? We have great examples happening in the Pacific around this local knowledge development for purpose, but what we need to be able to do is fund that for a longer period of time. The thing about ocean acidification is you can't just do a two-year project and understand what's happening and be done. You have to have the ability to have a sustained program that will give you a time series, that will give you baseline developments, and that you can measure and evaluate your adaptation strategies against going into the future. And we need real finance for that work. And so what I'm really uh, wanting to emphasize today is calling out the need for climate adaptation financing. So groups like GCF, uh, Jeff, UN environment programs, development banks, and really thinking about their ocean portfolios, their ocean adaptation projects, and is there a place for ocean acidification work within those? This is an event we hosted in Lisbon last year at the UN Ocean Conference to bring those actors together and have this conversation. Um, and then finally, I just wanna make a note about the UNFCCC, because we are here at COP28, and that's the convention that we are all organized around uh, supporting the goals and implementation targets of. We've released several um, policy papers, I'd say, through the UNFCCC, really trying to figure out what can be done now to use existing mechanisms to help build the research priorities, close the knowledge gaps, and think about the financing needs. And so to the extent you're interested, it's all on our website. We've been supporting the UN um, Ocean Climate Dialogue here at the UNFCCC with these types of recommendations. And it's a really meaningful opportunity to leverage existing networks that we have here for this work. Okay. So, and then lastly, uh, the Alliance on doing our part, we are really calling on national governments to commit to OA actions uh, to, that minimize and address ocean acidification towards the next UN Ocean Conference. Um, and that's really going to be a calling card that we'll be um, putting out more and more and really trying to bring more national governments into this work and helping them understand what we can be doing now. So that's it from me. And I'm really happy now to turn it over uh, to our first speaker, uh, who is from the Office of the Prime Minister in Fiji, uh, and very fittingly, I think, our climate uh, finance specialist, uh, Mr. Dewan. So, uh, Mr. Dewan, I'll call you over here if you'd like to, or if you'd like to stay, that's whatever your preference is. And thank you for kicking us off today. We appreciate it. Thank you, MC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues. It is an honor and a privilege to address you today to discuss the fundamental issue of uh, oceans, changing state of oceans. The Pacific region is the large and deepest ocean on earth. The Pacific Ocean is an integral part of the global climate system. Fiji as a leader and a champion of climate change is the Ocean's Nexus Champion. Today, I would like to address one of the most pressing challenges facing our oceans, which is acidification, essentially the absorption of excess carbon dioxide. Our oceans has, have observed a natural amount of carbon dioxide for thousands of years. But now, the acceleration in the amount of uh, carbon dioxide is altering the, the chemical composition of oceans. And this does damage selfish uh, reef building corals and other marine species such as tuna. 
indeed studies suggest that by 2050 only 15 percent of our current coral reefs around the world will exist if not addressed ocean acidification will impact on tourism food food security livelihoods and increased hazard to our vulnerable communities in the pacific island communities our livelihoods our culture and our tradition are deeply interwoven and engraved with our marine biodiversity. Therefore, the impacts from the die dying coral reefs and the decaying, uh, declining biodiversity from rising ocean acidification is devastating. The most recent IPCC report tells us that the combination of ocean acidification and the increasing sea surface temperatures means that the complete collapse of this ecosystem could occur before the end of the 21st century. And on that devastating journey, there will be various climate change, ocean nexus, tipping points along the way. Friends, we are on a big brick of irreversible change. What can we do? First, of course, is, is for deep cuts in our greenhouse gas emissions. As we have mentioned many times, this is a very real crisis for the Pacific Islands. Second is to increase research, monitoring, and understanding of ocean acidification to inform science, policy, and measures to mitigate and ad adapt to the ocean acidification. Third is to recognize that our Pacific Island communities have relied upon the oceans for generations. The economic and social impacts on our communities from oceans, from ocean acidification is therefore quite clearly a case for potential sustainable loss and damage. As we have highlighted at COP meetings, the Pacific nations contribute the least to the global carbon emissions, but bear, but bear the burnt of the impacts of climate change. This includes ocean acidification. We have to reserve this situation. The very least we ask is for adequate financing investments for oceans and coastline climate monitoring, research risk assessments, and measures for ocean acidification. This is why the participation of Fiji government in Ocean Acidification Alliance is so important. We recognize the need for adaptive policy and resources to address ocean challenges. The Pacific Island Ocean Acidification Center established in 2021 serves as a dedicated regional hub for research and monitoring in the Pacific region. Developed through a collaborative approach between SPC, the University of the South Pacific and the National Institute of Water Atmospheric Research and the University of Ota Otago focuses on addressing and mitigating the impacts of ocean acidification. With a core mission of enhancing capacity development and providing regional leadership on this critical issue. PIOC PIOAC plays a central role in supporting Pacific nations in their, effect, in their efforts to understand and respond to the challenges of ocean acidification. In this instance, I would like to thank the US State Department, NOAA, the Ocean Acidification Alliance, and other key partners supporting this issue. I hope this event and the impact of ocean acidification can catalyze further action and recognize and is recognized by the decision taken by parties here in Dubai. Friends, in closing, I would like to thank you for your presence here today and call upon each of you to turn your discussions into commitments. Those of us who have who are custodians of vast areas of ocean are entrusted with the responsibility to pass this unique ecosystem to future generations. 
let us rise to the occasion. The Pacific is not alone in this endeavor. Together, we can charter a course to a sustainable and resilient future for our oceans and the generations yet to come. Nakavakalevu, thank you. Panaka, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dewan, uh, for those opening remarks. It's a pleasure to have the Prime Minister's office here with us. And uh, like I said, I'm excited for you to hear more today about how much absolutely uh, how much leadership is being shown in the Pacific region on this topic right now. So that's a great way to kick us off. Um, all right, so second uh, little dual keynote remarks to kick us off is uh, my pleasure to introduce, probably nobody needs introduction, but uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, UN Special Envoy to the Ocean. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah. We've been talking about this for a while, haven't we? I see some very familiar faces in the audience, uh, happily some new ones as well. Uh, it's a vital issue. We cannot ignore it. Uh, it's not something that's going to go away without scientific uh, application of research and funds from public finance and uh, philanthropies and academia. We're all in this together. Uh, so let's uh, keep up our cooperation, our partnerships. The ocean uh, and climate nexus has been steadily growing in recognition. Uh, Sandy, you'd remember the days when we were well outside the tent, you know, trying to convince member states that they should be mentioning ocean change in terms of uh, climate change, that the two were uh, absolutely inextricably connected coming from the Pacific Islands, it was obvious to us. I mean, the sun, the ocean, and uh, that's what created the climate. And then along came this geoengineering experiment of pumping up all these anthropogenic greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we saw how that changed everything. Not such a great project, but uh, we're living with the consequences. We've got to do something about it. Uh, that's what meetings like this are about. So uh, we are making progress in that regard, I'm happy to say. And again, my country, Fiji, has been uh, in the front line with uh, fellow countries uh, in the Friends of Ocean and Climate um, uh, grouping, which has really forced the COP, first of all, in Glasgow to uh, recognize that there was a need for these ocean climate dialogues and uh, that they would be held annually in Bonn. Uh, maybe I think the first one was just to have one off. You know, they sort of gave us one. But once we got into that door, of course, it's now an annual thing, the Ocean and Climate Dialogues. And we now have co-facilitators, Canada and Chile, who go and report to plenary and tell them about what's going on in terms of the ocean and climate relationship and what needs to be done. And that's going to roll on. So those of you that can be there, those annual meetings at uh, UNFCCC in Bonn, which we call the Ocean and Climate Change Dialogues, very important that we're there along with attending these COPs. And ocean acidification is a big part of those dialogues. And remembering the differentiation between ocean acidification and all the other climate change issues, which are you know, essentially caused by global warming. Uh, with acidification, you've got a different process going on with the absorption of CO2 and what that is doing to the pH of the ocean and what that is doing to the marine ecosystems. Uh, which is, of course, where we see the effects in our communities, not just in the islands, but in places like the oyster beds of Northern Hemisphere. So um, it's a global issue, uh, and it's also a local issue. I mean, I think it's, mo it's felt mostly locally, because you've got your coastal communities. I mentioned oysters for, as an example. In our part of the world, you know, what's happening on our coral reefs and with those ocean acidification having profound effects in both cases. Uh, so it is local. So there's a lot that you can do locally. Uh, we need to be spreading the word about what that is. Uh, it's also regional, you know, because the ocean uh, is not a static thing. It's flowing from country to country. And in some of our cases, we live in very tight regions uh, of national borders. And of course, there's also the uh, global situation. So we need strategies that uh, cover all three levels. I'm really glad to know that uh, the uh, Pacific Island Ocean Acidification Center 
as well as working on uh, Fiji's situation, is applying its research and its monitoring and the and the guidelines that it gives regionally. And you'll hear more about that uh, today. A lot of this, of course, comes down to finance, so we've got to keep fighting for that dollar, uh, which is, uh, yeah, we had a pretty good day yesterday, $225 million towards the Blue Pacific Prosperity Initiative from the Bezos Earth Fund and... Uh, and from Jeff. So, uh, you know, the, the funds are starting to flow, but we've got to keep the fight on, otherwise they're going to go elsewhere. Uh, it's often said that SDG 14.3 is the least funded of the SDGs. Um, I don't lose any sleep over that one, I must admit, because at the same time we did an assessment before the SDG summit, and we found that SDG 14 was the second most successful in delivering on its targets. So um, maybe we didn't set the targets high enough. But uh, the, 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 the basic fact is there has to be a massive pivot of international funding for ocean science. Why? Because we need it for the ocean we want, uh, for the planet we want. We've got to invest in that ocean science. We've got the UN Ocean Decade there to help us get there. And we've got to invest it in the sustainable blue economy, sustainable blue economy because that's where the future for our children and grandchildren lies, both in health and in jobs and in terms of renewable energy in terms of food supplies it's all about the sustainable blue economy so we need a massive pivot in terms of where global funding is going towards those two uh, elements uh, but uh, yeah, I, I did also want to mention the uneven distribution there's a very good map that the ioc unesco has of uh papers uh, on ocean science published around the world and when, when you see the world map, it's a complete distortion. You know, Africa, for example, is hardly even there. There's a little grape down on the bottom, which is South Africa. Uh, South America is tiny, you know, smaller than Australia, uh, the whole continent of South America. But it's in places like UK are enormous. Uh, and Europe's obviously enormous, North America. And what that indicates is that there are not enough resources going in terms of academia and uh, in terms of uh, research grants to the South. Uh, we've got universities in the South which are very capable of doing this work, and I'm really glad that USP is, uh, you know, uh, has been involved for a long time now. But the same thing in Africa, superb universities in Africa, one of the longest coastlines in the world. Why isn't Africa a big part of this ocean acidification operation as well? I, I have learned from IOC UNESCO and uh, GOA and the OARS program, uh, GOAN, that there are these regional hubs being established in Africa now. So I hope when you look at that map in five years' time, it'll be a very different picture. And when I mention uh, what's going on at IOC UNESCO uh, through the OARS uh, program under the UN Decade of Ocean Science and their arm of Go on all these uh, acronyms, I know it's hard for us all to get hold of them. I also want to mention Ocean, uh, the uh, Ocean uh, Certification Alliance that Jesse's been running all these years. This work is fantastic. The, these, these dedicated people who have been carrying this now, for how long, Jesse, have you, is your organization in? Sorry? About seven. I think I went to one of your first meetings over in, where was it, San Diego or somewhere like that. Uh, so uh, they, they've done a fantastic job. They've carried the, this through because 14, SDG 14.3, don't forget, that's a universal thing that we all agree to, minimize and address uh, ocean acidification. You know, we've relied heavily on those uh, organizations I've just mentioned to carry that weight for us, but it's something we've all got to be involved in. I want to uh, conclude my opening remarks by saying, just let, let's not forget what we're doing here and, 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 and why we have this problem. You know, it's wonderful to see everybody. It's joyful to get together and once a year in these uh, climate uh, meetings. Uh, and, you know, the value of networking at them, I'm, I'm sure, is huge for uh, most of us. But let's just put the joy aside for a moment and, and remember what we're actually doing. You know, we're gathering at a place that is nearly at the end of the world, uh, if, you, if you think in terms of intergenerational uh, justice. We are heading towards a world of three degrees, which the Secretary General of the United Nations has aptly described as an unlivable world, unlivable, you know, a world of fire and floods and plague and famine. 
Uh, and that's where we're currently heading. We've got our kids on a bus going down a highway to hell towards three degrees. Uh, and the oil industry is saying, no, it's all okay. Don't worry. You know, we're making profits. We made $5 trillion worth of profits this year. It's all okay. We'll, we'll, we'll fund the transition to renewable energy. Well, their lie was exposed last week when the International Energy Agency published its report showing that the fossil fuel industry is only putting 1% of what's required in the contribution towards the transition to renewable energy. Now, if you saw the billboards on all the motorways and all the airports that you've looked at for the last five years, you would believe that they're leading that transition. Only 1%. So it's baloney. You've got to stop using their product. And you've got to do that because of intergenerational justice. And they're actually stealing our children's future. So uh, let's just remember why we're here. Don't get carried away by the joy. Don't get carried away by the greenwashing. We're here to confront the enemy. The enemy is the fossil fuel industry. Thank you. As always, thank you so much, Ambassador, uh, for being here, for your leadership for seven years and many years before that on this topic. Um, since the first UN Ocean Conference, uh, certainly in 2017, you have been a champion of the OA community and the OA family. Uh, without hesitation, you say, yes, I will be there. And you have been helping raise this profile as much as anyone. So thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so now we're going to dive in a little bit more to hearing about this Pacific Island OA Center. Um, we'll have just a, a couple brief uh, framing remarks from Pacific Community, who is the home entity of the OA Center. And then we'll hear two presentations from partners uh, who have been helping uh, implement some of the work on the ground and get a little bit of slides up to give you some pictures and sort of talk about the real work of what that entails and where the policy needs to go. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Taloi Bori, who is the uh, deputy director uh, for at Pacific Community uh, in Suva. So over to you, and thank you so much. You can stay there if you'd like. Thank you very much, and uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, the Ocean Acidification Alliance for extending this uh, invitation to the Pacific community. I am here on behalf of my colleagues that are actually working uh, at the center. Uh, so please bear with me. They've provided me with some notes uh, that I will briefly run through. Uh, I've been asked to provide a brief update on the work of the Pacific Islands Ocean Acidification Center. Also uh, some of the uh, key goals and needs uh, that the center currently identifies moving forward. But as you have uh, heard from the earlier speakers, for the Pacific, the ocean is uh, intrinsic to the lives of our people. Uh, it affects and revolves around um, our identity also uh, in regards to our, our daily livelihoods. And most of our countries rely on ocean resources to drive their national economies. And therefore, this discussion on the impacts of ocean acidification on the well-being of our resources is really critical to the to the Pacific, and uh, for us in our region, uh, it is no longer an environmental issue; it's an economic and social issue as well that cuts across different sectors uh, in the region. Let me uh, provide a brief uh, update on why the um, Pacific Island Ocean Acidification Center was formed. Um, we do acknowledge that the effects of ocean acidification are already being felt in our region and the uh, knowledge about its impact on ecosystems, especially on key species crucial for ocean food chains remains limited. And that is a reality that we have in our region uh, in regards to our understanding of this issue. This is an issue that is quite new uh, to many of our policymakers in the region. As highlighted by uh, Mr. Dewan from uh, the Office of the Prime Minister in Fiji, this center uh, was formed in uh, 2021 to address some of these gaps 
uh, but also to support ocean acidification capacity development uh, with our countries in the region. This is a regional initiative uh, which is managed uh, by SPC with a consortium of partners that includes the University of the South Pacific, uh, NIWA, uh, New Zealand, and the University of Otago. The funding and the implementation partners of the center uh, include the Ocean Foundation and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We also work closely with the Global Ocean Acidification Network and the Regional Pacific Islands and Territories Ocean Acidification Hub. To address the impacts of ocean acidification, we need to monitor and understand uh, local ocean acidification conditions in our environment. The center is now working with Pacific uh, and international partners to build capacity and find Pacific solutions to address the impacts of ocean acidification through a number of uh, different initiatives. One is uh, training to increase regional expertise in ocean acidification monitoring, advising on the application of monitoring to support adaptation and mitigation approaches, and thirdly, assistance with ocean acidification data management and accessibility through established data portals. If I may now quickly um, provide a brief on some of the key successes of the center. Since its inception in uh, 2021, the center has successfully conducted uh, and contributed to four regional training uh, courses, both online and face-to-face, -face, significantly enhancing local understanding and monitoring capabilities of ocean acidification. For instance, more than 300 Pacific Islanders participated in an online ocean acidification course for Pacific Island researchers and resource managers through the Ocean Teacher Global Academy organized by IOC uh, UNESCO. Secondly, a, a train the trainer course has also been uh, conducted to ensure the center is able to provide the expert support needed to build regional in-house expertise and, and capacity. Early this year, we provided hands-on training to 20 regional scientists in the Pacific Island countries, equipping them with the skills to monitor and understand impacts of ocean acidification in their local marine uh, environments. The center is also involved in equipment distribution and technical support to Pacific scientists who have been awarded the Global Ocean Acidification Network in a, in a box kit, which is a low cost kit that is used to conduct essential ocean acidification monitoring uh, in Pacific Island countries. None of this uh, would be possible without the incredible international collaboration and support that the center has received from the consortium and our funding and implementing partners. The robust international partnerships have facilitated access to global networks and also forums and enhanced our visibility and advocacy on the issue of ocean acidification. Looking ahead, our immediate goal is to set up monitoring stations around the region in partnership with our in-country Pacific scientists and expand the monitoring coverage to biological ocean acidification monitoring parameters mm -hmm. that can inform the impacts of ocean acidification on our food sources and marine ecosystem. We want to strengthen data management. We aim to improve data management practices, ensuring that ocean acidification monitoring data is readily accessible and can be effectively used to inform policy and adaptation strategies in our region. We are also promoting local, regional, and international collaboration to ensure we build stronger collaborative networks among our international and regional partners, Pacific Island researchers, government officials, and community members in the Pacific. In terms of our needs, before I end, to achieve the center's goals, we need sustainable financing, which was highlighted by His Excellency as well. And therefore, our being here and our continuous push in this process is really, really important to ensure that the global climate funding mechanisms do recognize the importance of oceans and ocean acidification. We need to also improve specialized scientific expertise to enhance our understanding of ocean acidification impacts. 
Finally, in conclusion, I would like to reaffirm our commitment to building ocean acidification capacity in the Pacific region. The Pacific Islands Ocean Acidification Center is committed to advancing our understanding of ocean acidification, enhancing regional capacity and developing sustainable solutions for Pacific communities. We invite continued support, collaboration from international partners and stakeholders as we collectively respond to the challenges that we face in our region in terms of ocean acidification. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Taloi Bori, for being here and for pitch hitting, uh, being called in by colleagues to uh, to talk about the center. We're grateful for it. Um, so now we have about 15 minutes left. So I'm just going to give our second, our last speakers uh, that in, in context. I'm really happy to introduce, and can I get the second presentation slides up in the back, please? Number two, thank you. Um, Dr. Kalina Gra uh, Grab, who is with NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program and is also with the Global Ocean Ocean Acidification Observing Network that you've been hearing all about. And Kalina is going to give us just a little bit more in depth of what it looks like and feels like to be working uh, at the center, what this research actually um, feels like. And, uh, and Kalina, if you feel some of the things have been said, you are invited to just tell us your perspective and speak from your heart about what you think this work, uh, the significance of this work, what the needs are, and what the opportunities are from your perspective. But we'd love to see photos if you have them. Thank you so much, Jesse. And I feel so honored to share the stage with so many distinguished guests. So thank you for speaking on so many wonderful efforts in the Pacific Islands. And um, I will give a little bit of a different perspective here. Um, I am at the No Ocean Acidification Program and also Secretariat for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, as Jesse mentioned. And I'm also here representing the wide breadth of international partners that have been involved in this work. And it has been a huge collaborative effort. And as you have heard from the previous speakers, ocean acidification is currently threatening the Pacific Islands, and they are particularly vulnerable because of their close connection with the ocean and their reliance on it. So the ocean supports their livelihoods. It um, underlies food security. So 50 to 90 percent of their protein comes from the oceans. And it also underlies their cultural and traditional practices. And ocean acidification is impacting the ocean. So as we all know, ocean acidification is the phenomenon when increased CO2 in the atmosphere due to anthropogenic pollution dissolves into the ocean, and that increases the acidity and decreases the pH. And this is a slow process that Jesse has mentioned. And it is also a global phenomenon, as Ambassador Thompson mentioned, that has local impacts. And so it's really important to provide the local areas around the globe with the ability to be able to measure and monitor ocean acidification so they can determine how it is impacting their individual communities in their own ways. And so NOAA in the US, we've been working to increase the capacity and the research and monitoring around ocean acidification. It's a federal priority for us. And so we actually have law that supports ocean acidification research and monitoring and capacity building. And we're able to develop this technology that we then can share with the global community as well. And so um, you can go ahead and go, oh, I think I have the slides here. <laughs> um, we, we also support Go On, and Go On is a regional, is a global network with over 900 participants from over 114 different countries. And there are nine regional hubs, and these regional hubs are built from the bottom up. So this is really important that these regional hubs come together from community members, and in the Pacific, the Pacific Island Hub, which is called PI Toa, was formed in 2018. And now it has over 175 members from 30 different countries. And they have steering committee members from Fiji, New Zealand, Samoa, and Vanuatu. And they have come together and determined what their priorities are in order to assess ocean acidification within the Pacific. And one of their priorities this year was to make a map to show the monitoring and research efforts in the Pacific. And they also have worked towards building a... Uh, a policy briefing document so they can go and talk to their policymakers about why ocean acidification is impacting their own communities. 
Another big effort that has gone on in collaboration with um, Go On through the PI TOA Hub, as well as the um, NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, U.S. Department of State, uh, the Ocean Foundation, is the building of this Pacific Island Ocean Acidification Center, which you have heard about. And this is jointly hosted at the Pacific Community, as well as the University of Pacific. And there's technical capacity from New Zealand and the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, Research and University of Otaga. And you've already heard a lot of different things about the center. And I actually realized that there have been so many things that have happened in the last two years at this center to further ocean acidification that's really hard to convey in this short amount of time. So just a few things, the four goals that they built this center around were to increase training, provide spare parts, increase long-term research, and also establish monitoring in the Pacific. And so I'll skip those details for the sake of time on what the center has gone into, but I just want to say that it's really important to have sustained funding to support these efforts. They've done a really good job. There have been leaders, especially in Fiji, that have stepped up to lead these efforts in the center, to do these trainings, to bring people in with different knowledge to share and to um, exchange. And to continue these efforts, it requires sustained and continued funding from a diverse audience. And it's really important that the communities build these resources so they can assess the ocean acidification in their waters in order to understand where they are vulnerable. And it, we are working as a global community to also be able to use this science in order to inform management about suitable habitats for things like aquaculture or to sustain um, coral reefs or shell fisheries. And in the Pacific, this has also been a really wonderful model that other global regions are turning towards. So for example, in the Caribbean, they are looking at what has been done in the Pacific by the building of the center, um, by the communities engaging their policymakers and having cross collaborations with international communities and interregion organizations. And this is a model that other regions want to follow. So it is really great to see it in the Pacific. The UN Ocean Decade has also been critical in highlighting this, and this has provided a platform to support visibility and capacity building, um, such as the Commonwealth Blue Charter, uh, the Go On program, which uh, UN Ocean Decade program, Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, or ORS, and this also supports um, a data management within this, the PIOAC Center to help the Pacific region meet the SDG 14.3.1 goals to submit data from every country on ocean acidification research. So I just want to close with saying that it has been really fruitful to be a part of this wide collaboration that involves international partners. And we hope to see an increase in collaboration for science, policy, and funding to support these ocean acidification efforts. And we also want to find additional partners to help support this work and increase conversations with policy and decision makers. So we're really grateful for Fiji's leadership in this. And thank you again for your attendance and for allowing my participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grab. Thank you for giving us a little bit of an overview of that work. And uh, last but not least, I'm very happy to introduce uh, a dear friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Alejandra Navarrete, who's gonna talk a little bit from her perspective uh, at the Ocean Foundation about the importance of uh, the national regional policy landscape um, and how this work fits in. So over to you to close us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesse, to put these together. Thank you for, I'm honored to be part of this panel and to be uh, with you today. I'm going to talk about a little bit, I'm not going to repeat what you already told about what the center is doing. So I'm going to go very quickly. I'm going to talk about policy and the way we have to work regionally. So uh, I have to use this. So uh, supporting regionally led away ocean acidification in the Pacific Islands. So what we have done, uh, you already heard Kalina and heard Mr. Tolabau. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All the incredible work that has been going on in the 
in the Pacific Center that was brought. So we have deployed and customized 12 go kits, the kits that Kalina was talking about. We have led three in-person trainings for more than 50 researchers. Uh, we have been part of those online uh, trainings for scientists and practitioners for more than 200 of them. We created plan, design, and secure funding for the center. And we have led two policy and management training courses. And we have started a legal review because there are some issues that we have to deal with. So part of what I'm going to talk about is what we have to do regionally and some of the needs that are in the region. So what is OA policy? So OA policy has to do with appropriations for mitigation and adaptation. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, for adaptation, we need uh, an early warning systems, hatchery intake valve controls, adding alkaline materials to buffer water. In the case of appropriations or incentives regulations for adaptation, uh, we need, uh, uh, oh, I already said that, I'm sorry. So I'm, I I have different in my, in my phone, sorry. So for mitigation, what we need is uh, actions that require and protect blue carbon habitats that address runoff and other land-based pollutants and otherwise enhance natural infrastructure to increase ecological and economic resilience for the community. We have to provide funding, as we have said before, from, uh, from Jeff, from the banks, from the GCF, because it's very important to have a long-term continuous monitoring and observation of ocean chemistry changes. We need to provide funding for scientific research studies for the impact of, of ocean chemistry changes. And we have to remove barriers to research, such as reducing duties on importing and monitoring equipment, which is very important because we cannot provide the OO kits if we have barriers to that. And that can be some of the problems we have been facing. Oh. What happened? Oh, so there are uh, multiple international policy frameworks that are in place that have already addressed some of the of what ocean acidification is. So that that is very good, but then we have to really enforce it within the countries. So now with the mainstreaming between biological diversity and ocean, I think we will have an opportunity to work into this. And I think we really have to grab it and, and, and enforce that, those policies in the countries. So in the case of... Uh, of the United Nations framework. We have some indicators. We have the ocean climate dialogue that was very difficult to build. So we'll have another session next year in June. So it would be very important for the countries to step up and talk about the needs in case of ocean acidification. We have uh, the SDG 14.3 that already was talked about. Uh, I love the sea has the biodiversity, the BBNJ treaty that we have to talk about that. And we also have to introduce what the seabed authority is doing about ocean acidification. Um, this is the mainstreaming between global policies, sectoral policies, and regional. So countries have to introduce into their climate change networks, ocean acidification policies. This is something we still have to work about this. Uh, here at the Pacific Islands, you have made a very good work with the Pacific Center. And I think this is something we, we have to continue working. Uh, there is uh, some problem that we have already faced. So we need a little bit of mercury for the for the 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 preserve the samples for OA. And the Minamata Convention doesn't let any of the countries work with mercury anymore because Minamata has come into force. So we're working now with the Minamata Convention to see how this is going to be addressed because right now there's, there's a lack of policy and a lack of clarity on how we can work with that. So this is something that we, we are going to be reviewing, which I think it's very important. And uh, thank you very much. This is...
all I have to talk about. Thank you so much, Alejandra. That was a great overview. If you want to learn more about the policy or the needs, please talk to Alejandra. If you want to talk more about the monitoring, talk to Kalina. Talk to all of our panelists. When Audrey tells me it's done and turn off the microphone, I do so. So thank you for being here, and I'm turning off the microphone.